Hi, thank you um, for coming to this uh, final session of the Mental Health Services Research Conference. Uh, today, we welcome our speakers from this panel of leaders from other agencies within the Health and Human Services who will be discussing the priorities for mental health services research within their agencies. Specifically, we welcome Robert Valdez, Director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, Anjali Forber Pratt, the Director of the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, NIDLAR, Sherry Ling, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Joaquina Scott, the Deputy Director for the Office of the Advancement of Telehealth at the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, and Anita Everett, the Director of the Center for Mental Health Services at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA. Um, we have a few housekeeping items. As a reminder, the, the recorded presentations will be available after the conference once closed captioning and other preparation is completed. An email will go out when the presentations are available and they'll go out on the NIH YouTube channel. Um, and we'll also try to make um, slides available from this talk as well. Um, following their presentations, we'll have a few minutes for discussion, so please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A button. As a reminder, when you click on the question mark box, if the pop-up box appears low in the bottom left of the screen, you can click and drag it elsewhere on your screen to make it easier to type. So Mike Fried, who's the branch chief of the services branch here at NIMH, will be moderating the discussion. So we'll begin with Dr. Valdez, the director of ARC. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Valdez. Thank you very much for the invitation to present to your audience. And um, I have the distinction of being the director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, an agency that probably many of you don't know, although uh, it is the legacy agency that uh, has been the home for health services research within the Department of Health and Human Services. Back then it was called Health and Edu Department of Health and Education um, uh, when it started in the early or in the mid to late 60s uh, and then followed through with a number of other organizations, finally ending up uh, in, in this organization called Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. So welcome to the home of health services research. And uh, we look forward to telling you a little bit about what we're doing on the mental and behavioral health side of uh, the area. The Congress has given us an audacious uh, this mission, and that is to produce the scientific evidence that makes healthcare all these amazing things. And uh, not only are we looking to make it safer and of higher quality, but we're also trying to make it equitable and affordable. Um, and obviously, uh, being an agency in the federal government, we can't actually do all of that without really relying on partnerships. And in particular, the partnerships with uh, state and, and tribal and local agencies around the country um, and nonprofit uh, organizations and professional associations, both health and health services research professional associations, and more, more importantly, uh, healthcare systems leaders and, and uh, executives who make the resource allocation decisions that affect how healthcare is delivered and what, whether healthcare can be effective. Uh, I just wanted to let you know a few of the current uh, ARC mental health initiatives. There are others. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work on the impact of COVID on mental health. Um, we are particularly interested in dealing with the issue of clinician burnout. Right now in the U.S. healthcare system and in other healthcare systems around the world, uh, clinician and actually the entire healthcare work workforce has been burnt out through the excessive demands of the COVID pandemic and then the uh, subsequent waves of people seeking services for uh, delayed services or postponed services. So um, my discussion with friends who are still operating health systems, uh, I escaped by coming to work for the federal government. Um, uh, the number one issue on their plate is workforce. The number two issue on their plate is workforce. And when I ask what the number three issue is, they said, didn't you hear me on the first two times? Workforce. Uh, so the workforce issues are, are creating issues of uh, patient safety uh, incidents that are rising. Uh, basically, in the United States, all the success that we've had in increasing patient and health professional safety over the last decade was wiped away by the uh, COVID pandemic over the last two and a half years. We're also looking at uh, opioid and substance abuse uh, crisis that uh, is in part driven 
by COVID, but also predates COVID. Um, but more importantly, we're also examining issues around alcohol and alcohol abuse, because that's the number one issue affecting uh, America when you look at substances um, that dates back decades. Uh, and certainly during the COVID pandemic, uh, we've seen an increased uh, abuse of alcohol uh, among all populations. Uh, in order to do this work, uh, we also support uh, an intramural program that relies on two of our major uh, statistical and surveys, uh, MEPS and, and HCUP, uh, which provide us uh, opportunities to do uh, statistical briefs using those data and illustrating how they can be used uh, by health services researchers to examine a whole variety of uh, other issues. I invite you to visit our, our MEPS and HCUP sites and uh, to use these data. Um, we also have an, a very active intramural research program. Um, I've just put a couple of the most recent uh, publications that our intramural researchers uh, have focused on, uh, one on opioids and one on um, uh, really mental health service delivery and financing. And then lastly, we have uh, within our agency a whole set of programs that look at how to make healthcare more effective. Um, and we're looking at strategies for how we integrate behavioral health care into primary health care in the United States. Uh, that includes an academy for, uh, for that purpose for uh, clinicians who are uh, in the beaver health uh, world and, and who need to understand how to become uh, integrated into systems that actually pay through uh, health insurance programs and, and others. Um, I want to uh, end my talk by just letting you know that we have a lot of uh, current funding opportunities. Most people don't realize that uh, ARC is a health services research funding organization, even though we are the original home for health services research, uh, in large part because we get hidden by our, our big brother, the NIH, who we rely upon to send out our notices for uh, funding and uh, allow us to use their, their well, they don't, not allow us, we actually pay. <laughs> we are a customer of NIH uh, to do our health services research programs. And usually the, uh, the announcements uh, are for the usual type of R01 research projects, also small grant programs, uh, research and demonstration programs, and a whole host of training grants that include K awards and, and others. So I invite you to uh, look at the ARC uh, website uh, and find uh, one of these announcements that covers the areas that you're interested in. We have a number of special interest areas that are focused on uh, uh, mental and behavioral health uh, services research, and we invite you to uh, submit your programs and your projects to us. Thank you. Dr. Valdez, thank you very much. Uh, next up, Dr. Forber Pratt. Hello, thank you everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to join here today. Um, my name is Dr. Anjali Forber Pratt, and as you heard in the introduction, I am the director of NIDLER, the National Institute of Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, which is housed within the Administration for Community Living. Um, today, I am wearing a pink shirt and a black blazer, and I have brown skin and black hair. I'm so excited to share some of Nidler's work on psychiatric disability work and our key priority areas on mental health. Um, I should also say that I am sitting in a manual wheelchair, which I've learned I have to disclose here on the video on the video screen. Uh, for those who don't know, Nidler is the federal government's um, main disability research arm. And let me see if I can get these slides here to advance. No, oh, one second. There we go. All right. Um, and our main purpose is to fund grants that will generate new knowledge and to promote effective use to improve the abilities of individuals with disabilities to perform activities of choice in the community and fully participate in society. My main takeaway message for the mental health services and research, and research community is that mental health research is disability research. Mental health and serious mental illness have long been a part of, of Nidler's disability portfolio across the lifespan, across three of our major outcome domains, which are employment, health and function, and community living. 
Um, on, these ne on this next slide, I wanted to just so that this will make sense later, the alphabet soup that is our various grant mechanisms, just so that you can um, have this to refer back to at a later point in time, and to see how over in 2021, how our grant funds have been distributed across these mechanisms. More relevant to this conversation, though, is what are we funding related to psychiatric disability work and mental health? So we currently have 30 grants within our portfolio that are focused on improving outcomes for youth or adults with serious mental illness or mental health um, challenges across one or more of these domain areas. Included in this portfolio are two advanced rehabilitation research training projects that recruit and train postdoctoral fellows in research that focus on improving outcomes for people with psychiatric disabilities. And we also have 16 three-year field initiated projects six five-year disability rehabilitation research projects, and our largest funding mechanism is the Rehabilitation Research and Training Centers. And these are five-year grants that are funded at the $875,000 level per year. And historically, these RRTCs have been recompeted every five years, and we currently have four RRTCs related to mental health. As far back as 1979, Nidler has worked and collaborated with SAMHSA on funding these RRTCs that really focus on improving the lives of adults with serious mental illness to better enable them to live the lives that they choose in the community. Over the years, we've been able to add in youth and young adults in, into this. And while unfortunately in 2019, the formal partnership between Nidler and SAMHSA ended, we are working with leadership changes and working closely with Dr. Everett's leadership and many wonderful conversations among our respective staff to explore potential collaborations and make sure that key evidence from research findings from these grant from our grantees are getting to her team as well. In addition to the grant mechanisms from other slides, um, these are the four currently funded um, funded projects. And again, we'll make sure that these are become available um, so that you can uh, click on these hyperlinks. Um, while I don't have time to share the details of these specific projects, the work generated from these RRTCs have foundations in the social model of disability as well as in psychiatric rehabilitation. The work complements the mental health care field and has led to the development of evidence-based interventions and practices such as vocational cognitive remediation, individual placement and support, chronic disease management approaches, and integrated support education and employment. As I boil this down into what are the five main priority areas are for Nidler in relation to mental health priorities, we need more research in underrepresented populations with mental, for individuals with mental health conditions. We also want to return to a focus on children with mental health and serious mental illness. It was never that we are not interested in this, but over the years, there's been an accidental shift in our portfolio that some of our grantees actually have pointed out to us. And I would be remiss without naming that the mental health challenges experienced by our young people as they're still processing huge disruptions in schooling due to the pandemic, horrific af aftermath from witnessing and or being aware of school shootings, among many other things. We also prioritize in Nidler hiring individuals with lived experience with mental health conditions as advisors, researchers, co-investigators, trainers, consultants, and staff. And this trend has been strong with Nidler grantees, but we must continue to name it to not only combat the stigma around disclosure of mental health, but also to make sure that the research being conducted is stronger, better, relevant, and usable. We also are very interested in scaling up the evidence-based interventions and using those to inform mental health practice. So one example of this from our grantees are self-directed care from a randomized control trial. This Medicaid self-directed care model has been adapted for people with serious mental illness and has led to improved symptoms, self-esteem, coping mastery, employment, and enrollment in post-secondary education, as well as satisfaction with services. Um, we also have seen from our grantees, as another example, that college students with mental illnesses tend to be less engaged on college campuses, have poor relationships with students, faculty, and administrators, yet interventions show extreme promise, such as peer-facilitated community participation. So we're really invested in taking these interventions that may have been initially created during stabilization phase to maintenance to recovery. It's about lifelong need for services and interventions and then tailoring them to meet the individual needs. 
when the other the last um, priority area that we have that we're really interested in is increasing the depth of research for individuals with serious mental illness and other co-occurring disabilities. As one example, Nidler's model system programs in spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury and burn injury. They provide coordinated systems of rehabilitation care and conduct research on recovery and long term outcomes, including mental health outcomes. These programs also track, these model system programs track patients in long-term longitudinal databases and that goes back far back as 25 years worth of data post-injury. And researchers, these longitudinal da databases are freely available for secondary analyses and studies. And so this is one, one opportunity for researchers who might be interested in engaging in this work. We also have two, um, two forecasted um, opportunities that I wanted to share. Whoops, and here they, whoops, I don't know where those went. Well, that's all right. We have two forecasted opportunities of, that are coming up, which are two recompetes of, of rehabilitation research and training centers. One that's specific on promoting healthy aging among people with long-term serious mental illness, and one on community living and participation among people with serious mental illness. More details of these forecasted opportunities will be coming in the, in the coming months, and you can check out grants.gov to learn more. But if you're also interested in any of the research findings of the existing grants of those 30 that I shared, NARIC.com is a wonderful clearinghouse of both Nidler grants as well as the broader rehabilitation research field. Um, which I've shared here on the screen. And my service dog, Colton, hopes that you are this excited about applying to Nidler to conduct and carry out your mental health research. And if you're interested in learning more, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly, to our director of research, Dr. Beatty, or to Dr. Painter, who is our program specialist, um, specifically on our mental health portfolio. And happy grant writing. Thanks, everyone. Dr. Forber Pratt, thank you so much. Next up, Dr. Lang. Yes, and, and let me begin first by saying uh, my sincere thank yous uh, for uh, such an amazing conference, uh, sharing of information, but also for all of the important work um, that you all do, which is uh, to fund and to uh, generate the evidence. Um, so um, I will begin by um, clicking on the right thing. Um, so uh, just just to say, um, so CMS, un unlike uh, our other colleagues' uh, work and authorities that, that were just mentioned, um, CMS is really more of an implementation agency that actually builds programs, policies, um, and refines, uh, implements those policies, and then refines those policies um, on, on uh, rather than generating new evidence, um, really building on uh, the work, the evidence that is created. Um, and um, uh, by way of context, then CMS is and remains the largest payer for and purchaser for health care services around the world, um, touching upon the lives of approximately one in three um, Americans. Um, and now, importantly, and if asked, then, you know, what are CMS's research priorities? I would say overall, it is to have the evidence um, that CMS needs to really implement effective uh, policies applicable to care and service delivery that meets the needs of um, those people who we serve across Medicare and Medicaid and, and marketplaces. Um, I, I will just by way of background as an example, um, illustrate uh, what I mean by that. And this is a a uh, snapshot of the Medicare fee-for-service beneficiary population, um, illustrating that there are several uh, mental health and substance use disorder conditions that appear uh, along the, the y-axis here. Displayed in blue are is the percentage of the population uh, for which that condition is the single and only condition. But what you see as you, you your eye moves towards the right is a, 
a largely purple slide um, that illustrates the percentage of the Medicare beneficiary population in free for service that has five or more other conditions in addition to the index condition viewed here. So I would say that comorbidities really loom large um, and has been an important fact as we look towards uh, supporting the healthcare needs uh, for people with mental and behavioral health conditions. Um, and as such, uh, have recently redefined um, and evolved the, the previous opioid roadmap into a CMS behavioral health strategy. Um, and this launched in uh, earlier this year. Um, and as part of this, we took the opportunity to really redefine what we mean when, uh, from the program and policy perspective for CMS by behavioral health. And to take a whole person's view of, of this strategy we thought was important. That is, you know, whole per, enabling whole person care that really addressed uh, the needs crossing physical, mental, uh, behavioral health uh, across the care continuum from primary care to specialty care across all facility types that a, a person who receives care and services um, during the course of their lifespan and lifetimes. So we took the opportunity also recognizing the comorbidities to put on the same side of the coin, substance use disorder, mental health, and also pain, both acute and chronic pain, given the comorbidities that we have been observing in the Medicare beneficiary population. I will say that comorbidities also loom large across Medicare and also um, in marketplace populations. So what are the goals of the CMS behavioral health strategy? They are, as they appear here, um, these are uh, in interlocking, interwoven, bold goals to um, goal one is to strengthen equity and quality in behavioral health care. Goal two is to improve access to substance use disorder prevention, treatment services, and recovery services as well. Goal three is to ensure effective pain management and treatment to all who all beneficiaries who need it. Goal four is to improve access to mental health care and services, and goal five is to utilize data to uh, inform effective actions and measure impact on a person's health, ideally um, driving towards better health outcomes um, for the people who we serve. How does CMS do this? We actually have specific authorities ranging from coverage to payment to setting minimum health and safety standards for all Medicare participating facilities across the country to enforcement of, of those, those standards to quality improvement and quality measurement. And in, in just in short order, flagging for you that the work that the behavioral health strategy aligns with is also the CMS national quality strategy with the principles that are depicted here. Um, in the interest of time, I would like to flag that this work began a while back in the form of meaningful measures. That is a cascade of metrics that address important and critical uh, domains. And I will say that on the right lower corner here, we have inserted behavioral health representing CMS's commitment to uh, fulfilling the expectations that quality would be applicable to behavioral health care and services. And just as an example, so that, that you understand the, con the uh, continuum uh, over which quality measurement for purposes of public reporting, but even more so as measurement evolves for purposes of incentives and achieving value of care and services, again, value to the people who we serve. This just gives you an idea of all variety of settings that, that quality applies to. And final slide is just to say, here is where you can find more information on the CMS uh, behavioral health strategy with resource links, including our, our, our rollout that, that occurred 
um, at the CMS Quality Conference uh, earlier this year. And with that, I say thank you and uh, really look forward to the, the discussion. Over. Great, thank you, Dr. Lane. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Scott. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joaquina Scott, and I am the Deputy Director for HRSA's Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. And I will also look to uh, try to advance my slides. Uh, let's see here. So our office, or what we refer to as OAT, has the role of serving across HHS to leverage telehealth to improve access, enhance outcomes, and support clinicians and patients. Our programs promote the use of telehealth technologies for healthcare delivery, education, and health information services. And we provide funding for direct services, research, and technical assistance in the field of telehealth. Uh, for the last 30 years, HRSA has been a leader in the field of telehealth. Uh, the first telehealth program began in 1988 and was funded through the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And since the 1990s, HRSA staff has been leading or co-leading a work group of federal agencies involved in telehealth, which we refer to as FedTel. Uh, in the early 2000s, the office Office for the Advancement of Telehealth was established at HRSA. And in 2020, as we all know, uh, telehealth expanded due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. And so our office began serving a broader role. And in 2021, there was some reorganization within our agency of HRSA, and we became a standalone office with a broader telehealth role reporting directly to um, HRSA's administrator. Uh, this slide here provides an overview of our uh, planned activities. All of OAT's programs um, will uh, be continuing in these upcoming fiscal years. Uh, we have currently no um, uh, awards or competitive awards that we plan to have in this upcoming fiscal year. Um, there is a new program, an evidence-based uh, direct-to-consumer program that we had put in the president's budget, um, but we will um, see if there is funding for that that will allow us to implement that program. So I thought that might be helpful for your information. Uh, this slide here really just shows how we envision our investments um, as a continuum of grant programs to advance uh, the provision of telehealth services with a focus for rural and underserved communities while also building an evidence base for telehealth. So with that first blue box, box the Centers for Excellence, the Centers of Excellence, uh, they monitor the clinical and uh, cost effectiveness of telehealth visits compared to um, in-person visits. Our evidence-based telehealth program is more of a nationwide program, um, and those grantees uh, tend to collect a lot more data and measures so that way we can uh, better understand um, how those telehealth services um, uh, are in comparison to services received through in-person encounters. Uh, the current cohort of 11 grantees are utilizing direct-to-consumer telehealth technologies to demonstrate how health networks can increase access to healthcare services. Uh, there are three primary focus areas, uh, the clinical areas for this program, primary care, behavioral health care, and acute care. And six of our 11 grantees are actually focusing on behavioral health. We also have uh, two telehealth-focused rural health research centers at the University of Iowa and University of Arkansas for medical sciences. And uh, these centers analyze and publish uh, telehealth research using the data from the evidence-based telehealth program as well as the broader field of telehealth research. So for example, uh, one of our research centers at the University of Iowa is currently looking at telebehavioral use among rural and urban Medicare beneficiaries. Um, we expect this data uh, from this study to be out later this year. Uh, we also have a telehealth network grant program, which is designed to use these evidence-based models to achieve the broadest uh, impact. So the current cohort of our grantees consists of about 30 recipients in 25 states who are working towards promoting 
rural tele-emergency services by enhancing these telehealth networks to deliver 24-hour emergency department consultation services via telehealth to rural providers without emergency care specialists. And the priority services for this program include behavioral health or stroke. Um, and about 11 of the uh, awardees out of the 30 are focused on behavioral health tele-emergency services. We also fund um, additional grants to support telehealth efforts, including what we call our telehealth resource centers, and they provide technical assistance and a licensure and portability grant program, which provides support for state professional licensing boards to develop and implement state policies to reduce those barriers to the provision of telehealth services. Um, another program I wanted to mention that is not on this slide um, is a telehealth um, technology enabled learning program, which connects specialists at academic medical centers with primary care providers in rural and um, underserved populations to provide that support in treating patients with complex conditions in their communities. So out of nine, out of the nine grantees for this program, uh, five are focusing on behavioral health. Uh, we also uh, manage a telehealth.hhs.gov website, which is a one-stop resource for patients and providers for information about telehealth, including telehealth best practices, um, how-to information, policy updates, and implementation resources. You'll see um, on this slide that we do have a best practice guide for telehealth for behavioral health care. And we're also expanding this website to track federally funded research, including research related to behavioral health. Um, just to speak briefly about activities across HRSA, uh, we're hoping to you know, update some of this information on this slide for fiscal 2021 data soon. Uh, but for fiscal 2020, during fiscal year 2020, during the height of the pandemic, HRSA did award uh, more than a billion for uh, telehealth related activities. Uh, they had approximately, we had approximately uh, 3,800 awards that included telehealth during fiscal year 2020. Our awards are located all across the country in all 50 states and in the territories. And um, the telehealth uses supported by HRSA have included workforce training, uh, direct clinical services, distance learning, technical assistance, and research. We also see telehealth as a tool to improve health equity. So there are a wide range of target populations supported by telehealth awards, including um, many of the populations you see here on this slide, from rural communities to low-income populations to homeless populations, um, as well as school-based populations. Um, telehealth focus areas supported by HRSA, again, in fiscal year 2020, included primary care, uh, behavioral health, and, and um, substance use disorder, and opioid use disorders, among other areas. Uh, again, as you can see from this slide, the majority of our wards do focus on mental health care or addressing um, substance use or um, opioid use disorder. Overall, uh, you know, be beyond like the telehealth and um, other efforts to increase access to telebehavioral health, you know, HRSAT does have a number of behavioral health initiatives that I would I will mention um, briefly, but not go into details as um, some of my other colleagues in HRSA could probably speak more to such efforts, but there is a focus on improving overall access to behavioral health services in rural and underserved communities, uh, improving the behavioral health outcomes for children, youth, and family, addressing behavioral health um, workforce shortage issues, and also efforts related to the integration of behavioral health into primary care. So um, along with those uh, focus areas and initiatives uh, for these areas here. Of course, we're always um, interested in learning more about what the research says in, in these areas too. Um, so as I come to a close, I really wanted to just share a few resources for you um, as the slides become available. Wanted to make you aware that we do put out announcements with um, some focus on just key telehealth related policy updates or research or funding. Um, they only come out periodically, uh, maybe once or twice a month. 
Um, and then I also have provided some additional resources that you may find helpful, um, HHS resources, as well as resources from the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. Um, so I thank you for your time, and I also look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott. Mm -hmm. Dr. Everett. a federal agency called SAMHSA, and I uh, also want to begin by thanking my colleagues at NIMH as well as other federal partners in um, uh, putting together this conference and so that we could talk a little bit to the research community about, um, in my case, needs that we have information that we would like to have generated from the research community so that we can use the information that you create. I consider us to be sort of a user, so to speak, of, of information. I have several examples I want to talk a little bit about and give you a heads up regarding some of our priorities. Uh, so this is the way that our agency depicts its mission and priorities. I've highlighted our circled in orange, the two most, uh, the two components that fit directly in the mental health services space. SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has uh, goals and authority uh, that extend in, from mental health services, but also includes substance use disorder conditions as well as prevention services, the prevention activity primarily being in the substance use disorder space, but to some extent also in the mental health uh, prevention and, and mitigation uh, area. So those are the sort of the main focuses. So I'll be talking a little bit more about those orange circles uh, there as we go through the talk. A little bit of an orientation to SAMHSA itself. So SAMHSA um, is comprised of four central parts, uh, each of those depicted there in the blue around the, the hub office of our assistant secretary. Um, the center that I direct is in the light blue there, the Center for Mental Health Services, but we also have three other centers that might be relevant to some of your work. That includes CSAT, the Sub Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, CSAP, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, and CBISC, which is the Center for Behavioral Health Statistics and Quality. And as is the case with uh, what was mentioned earlier from ARC, uh, about data that's available for secondary data analysis. Our CBISC uh, data includes a number of nationally prominent and important um, uh, data sources, all of which are publicly available for uh, analysis. I wanted to review to, uh, with you a little bit about what we do uh, and use my center as an example. So in, in the Center for Mental Health Services, we have three formula grants. These are grants that are distributed by a formula based on population and prevalence of illness to our stakeholders, which are the 50 states and uh, territories. Uh, we have three formula grants, the Block Grant, the PATH Grant, and the PAMI Grant. And why I'm even explaining that to you as researchers, you wouldn't be eligible per se to apply for these grants. But one of the things that the grants do is give the states wide latitude to um, look at services development for individuals um, with serious mental illness and serious emotional disturbances. One of our favorite policy stories, um, Michael Fried's division and, and mine over at SAMHSA is the first episode psychosis story, which went from, uh, you know, started, had its grounding in uh, NIMH supported research, the, a study called RAISE, and then subsequent studies that looked at effectiveness of the RAISE intervention, their recovery after an initial episode of uh, schizophrenia. And uh, really with very small amount of work, uh, took that, um, got the eye of Congress, and what happened uh, as a result of RAISE, which demonstrated effectiveness in uh, the management, identification and management of early psychosis, um, uh, Congress added what's called a set-aside to the block grant, and so what that did was create funding for every single state uh, and territory to support the development of uh, uh, evidence-based first episode psychosis programs that were based on the RAISE model. So what that is, is a rapid scaling up of uh, a, 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 a research that was found to be uh, effective uh, through, this, through a SAMHSA mechanism. Now, to date, there are something like 350 uh, first episode psychosis programs uh, nationally, and they are still connected through uh, one of the research projects that NIMH is working on, the EpiNet uh, project, which, which maintains a database and other coordination for grant opportunities in the style of a learning community, um, which is, is an example of the kind of partnership we're very much looking to for, for, form as we move forward with NIMH. We also have a series of, the, so those are the block grants and one of the policy stories that goes along with the block grants. We also have a series of what are called discretionary grants 
These are grants typically that uh, are given to us, uh, an amount of money that's allocated to us by Congress for a particular focus. Uh, a focus might be school-based mental health services. A focus might be trauma um, re resilience, promoting trauma-informed um, resources uh, to de be developed across a community that's experienced trauma, uh, such as some of the racially-based trauma that has experienced has been experienced recently. And uh, another example is... Um, uh, well, well, I'll talk more about some of the examples as we move forward, but the, the CCBHC is, one, is a big example for us as certified community payroll health clinics. Uh, these, uh, these grants are not the kind of grants that, that promote, that fund research, primary research, but they are very much the kind of grants that want to be in a position to use the research that you generate. So each of these grants for us comes out to the world through a notice of funding opportunity, a NOFA, we, we call it which includes a set of required activities. We can only go so far down the track in specifying exactly what those required activities are to be. But increasingly, I'm really holding us to assuring that um, the required activities section includes things that have an evidence base. So why I'm saying that to you as a research community is that we need your research to help us shape those, those, um, those required activities. And we also want to help you um, scale up research that you find that it that you've established is is effective, you know, in a well-powered um, study, well-powered and well-designed study. Uh, we need something in order to become an element of a required activity in our NOFO, and we fund something on the order of three thousand different grants across the country. So we're not a small uh, enterprise. Um, we, uh, you know, we look for a, a level of evidence that's something like clear and convincing. We don't have to have, uh, well, anyway, we get into the details of that, but that's what we're looking for is, is, is really good, solid research that we can include uh, in our, as a required activity in our notice of funding uh, that goes out to the field so that we can help to scale up your research so that we can get better results for the consumers and patients that are served by these systems. Uh, now what I wanted to do is spend a little bit of time focusing on uh, three different areas uh, that are priority areas for us. One of those is improving access. And uh, Dr. Freed asked me in particular to talk a little bit about 988, which I'll do in a minute. Uh, improving the quality of treatment once you're in the box of treatment, so to speak, once you're in that setting. Uh, and through the CCBHC model, which I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, and then uh, we also have uh, have gotten quite a bit of money and interest uh, lately in supporting um, the multi-tiered school-based services, school-based mental health services. Each of these areas, these three areas here, have had triple, quadruple the funding that comes about through uh, multiple of the COVID and COVID relief um, acts, uh, as well as most recently the uh, supporting uh, Building Safer Communities Act or the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which uh, was created uh, recently in Congress as a result of some of the recent shootings, including the shooting at Uvalde. Um, the, the, each of these grant series was a recipient of additional funds to get out to the field uh, in these three areas. So first, I want to talk a little bit about crisis services. Uh, hopefully you are aware that uh, two weeks ago, uh, nationally, uh, from anywhere in the United States that you are on any cell phone or landline, you can dial 988 and you will be connected to uh, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Well, the phone will be answered by um, trained uh, in crisis counselor individuals, uh, and um, uh, you will receive counseling or and or other information that's relevant to the situation that you're calling about. We've done a lot of work to really prioritize um, the increased response rate of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, but we have a lot, a lot of unanswered questions with regards to what are the best um, mechanisms and processes for that? One of the ways that we think about crisis services is uh, a person in crisis needs someone they can talk to. If that's not effective, uh, then they need someone who can respond in person to their situation and um, they need um, a place to go. So uh, we, the data that you see there is uh, real data that's from one state, from the state of Arizona, from one system in Arizona. But what we know already from that one, data set is that um, the telephone answers in and of themselves stop a lot of the need for or mitigate the crisis service system so that or the, the person in crisis so that um, 
uh, a response may or may not be needed and the person may or may not need to go on to, um, to hospital care uh, because the call is so effective. There are many, I'm gonna, let's see, I didn't do the right thing there, I didn't. Uh, I can't advance my slides anymore. Yeah, I'm looking for the advanced thing. Can you see the next slide that says un unanswered questions? Can someone tell me that? Hello? Okay, there no. we go. Yeah. These are unanswered questions uh, that we have regarding the, the, uh, the 988 and crisis services system. There are a lot of questions that we have, and I'm not in the interest of time. I'm not going to go to the, through those questions. Uh, this is the second of the three I want to talk about, the CCBHC program. It's a certified community behavioral health program. It has many parts to it clinically. Each of those parts needs more solid data or evidence to support it, and there's many opportunities to work there. We have... Uh, and the next slide, uh, I'll tell you, well, shoot, let's see, I messed that up. And the next slide here, I'm, I'm rushing a little bit because I do see my time uh, is up. <laughs> or my time was shortened because I'm at the, the end. Um, I, I just did want to let the community know that as an example of something that we hope to see more of, um, we have partnered with NIMH uh, to uh, take a look at implementation strategies for implementing some of the clinical services that need to happen for a community mental health center or other clinic setting to become certified as a certified community behavioral health center. And so there you have the link for the notice of special interest that's out. Um, I wanna just say a quick word. Uh, so they're, they're happy to talk and follow up with that. I wanna say a quick word about our school-based mental health services. There are a number of unanswered questions about what is the best way to, um, to um, affect the kind of uh, uh, change that we wanna see in our schools. Uh, it's not a simple um, uh, access to mental health treatment services. We, we really insist on a multi-tiered model, the three-tiered model, uh, which is a good old fashioned public health model of universal selected and indicated interventions. However, within those layers, we aren't able because the evidence is sort of variable at this point in time to, uh, to, to recommend particular interventions that are particularly, that we know are more effective than others. And so we're, we've kind of got a wide open um, required activity set uh, among those. The last slide that I want to talk just a little bit about is to remind you as researchers that, you know, many people that, you know, I've worked with throughout my career in research uh, like to hope that the world is a linear world, but we know that it's not. Uh, and, and when research and findings um, uh, bump up against politics, which is often what happens when, when government gets involved, uh, which is a necessity in the mental health space, um, there are, you know, can be things that are unpredictable. What I, what I want to sort of end with or my takeaway is that there does remain a huge gap between leading edge research and what's available to actual patients and consumers and people in need uh, in actual practice and, and community settings. We need more of that closure of that gap. gap. SAMHSA, we, at SAMHSA, we really want to be a translational vehicle for you, the research that's properly powered and uh, and demonst you know, effective, demonstrates effectiveness. Um, we really want to be in a position to help you scale up your findings. Uh, and our people with living, living with mental illnesses need access to effective treatment and recovery support services. I also want you to know broadly as a research community that our Congress in the United States is extremely interested right now. We've been very successful with a number of bipartisan initiatives that support uh, mental illness. We're kind of on a roll. Uh, it is just in a, one brilliant example of that is the CMS strategy, which is, is um, very exciting to us that CMS, which is, as Sherry mentioned, the largest funder of mental health services anywhere, particularly in the United States, um, uh, that we're very excited now that now's a good time to generate really good data that we can use. We want to help you scale up uh, your good data. Uh, thank you. That, that concludes my talk from SAMHSA. Great. Thank you, Dr. Everett. Um, all right, we have a number of questions, uh, but first I just wanted to announce that um, uh, in the, to the audience, uh, there's a line in the resource box uh, that's titled Federal Panel Contact Information, and that opens up to a list of uh, names and emails to uh, all five panelists. Um, so let me jump over to the questions. Um, 
And uh, maybe the first one uh, asked to uh, Dr. Valdez, uh, could you say a little bit more about the relationship among uh, AHRQ, uh, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and research funders like the NIH uh, that respond to task force recommendations and research priorities? Uh, yes, uh, the uh, U.S. Sur Sur Preventive Services Task Force is an independent body, uh, but is housed within ARC and uh, ARC staff, uh, particularly our EPC program, which is the uh, program that does evidence reviews and uh, evidence uh, consolidation, uh, provides the technical support for the task force's deliberations and, and works under the direction of their, uh, of their workforces and their task forces. Um, uh, I can't really say much about the relationship between NIH and ARC and the task, task force itself because most of the work actually takes place uh, within that, that sphere and the normal relationships between uh, the, the work of our EPC program in collecting uh, research studies and findings from throughout uh, sources, scientific sources, some of which and the, uh, a large number of which are supported by NIH grants and grantees, uh, are produced by grantees, uh, are part of that larger examination. Uh, many of the research studies, of course, uh, are not relevant to a direct uh, service uh, recommendation. So some of them uh, obviously get tossed out as, as the evidence gets whittled down to what's actually actionable and knowledge that can be used in a, in a clinical setting. Um, and sometimes what we're looking at is uh, research that's done in, in a, a pretty sanitized uh, area, so we don't actually know whether those findings work in the real world. So uh, that's always the, the work the task force has to project and understand uh, as they do their work. Um, but certainly the work uh, sponsored by NIH and the various uh, institutes at NIH uh, provide much of the, the, uh, the information from which uh, those recommendations get uh, developed. Great. Thank you, Dr. Valdez. Uh, next question for uh, Dr. Scott. Um, uh, really kind of two questions or a couple questions, but I'll merge them together. Um, have there been any particular problems or challenges that your office has been aware of, either uh, with the rapid transition to behavioral health, to telehealth, or the, the shift now to some uh, hybrid in-person services? And kind of relatedly, uh, do you have any data that you can share about clients' use of telehealth services for mental health in terms of access to care, engagement with treatment, um, and acceptability, as well as maybe outcomes associated with, with, with telehealth? Great questions. Um, just in first to the first question about challenges. Uh, I didn't mention because of lack of time, one of the programs that um, it's a small pilot program, but it is related to uh, broadband access. So as telehealth has increased and particularly trying to have more access to telehealth for behavioral health services um, and, and having that, that audio and visual connection, broadband has always been a key issue that a lot of the stakeholders have, have raised to our attention. Um, as well as just overall access to behavioral health providers. And so, um, you know, just making sure that uh, it kind of goes back to uh, better understanding of how behavioral health can be integrated into um, primary care services or just having that connection so um, that, uh, you know, community, people in the community have access to behavioral health providers. And once they have that provider, that they're able to make that connection. So those were just, just some of the challenges that have been brought to our attention. In terms of the data, um, there is some data that HRSA um, has publicly available. As I mentioned, um, you could go to telehealth.hhs.gov for some of the research that we flagged that may publish data from uh, uh, some of the our, our grant programs that are funded, but HRSA also has a um, data warehouse, and you can access it at uh, more data, uh, data.hrsa.gov, um, and you will be able to find uh, more information uh, uh, just about just some of the telehealth visits, uh, particularly for our health centers program. Um, you'll find a little bit more information in, in 
uh, one of the things we are working more on is having more of that um, outcome data. Um, and uh, that's something that we'll, we'll look to have, um, you know, hopefully uh, more of that in the future, either on our data.hrsa.gov site or on the telehealth.hhs.gov site. Great. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Uh, next question for Dr. Forber Pratt. Um, in one of your slides, you mentioned several centers uh, addressing mental health. Are there any preliminary findings that you're especially intrigued or excited about? Um, I cannot get myself unmuted. Oh, so thank you. Somebody got me unmuted. I appreciate that. There are so many different findings that I encourage folks to check out um, narrick.com, but a few highlights to me. So we, one of our funded projects has been looking at a hybrid supported employment program and education program designed to uh, improve the continuity of services and results are showing improved engagement um, over time. Another, another key finding has been from our vocational empowerment photo voice, where they developed an intervention to empower individuals with, with mental health conditions to pursue work and engage employment services by enhancing their vocational identity through the, the use of, of, um, of photo voice, which has also been particularly promising. Um, and, other, and other key findings are that, that individuals with serious mental illness are as likely to be parents as the general population, but seven times more likely to have contact with CPS and 26 more times likely to have a child removed from their home. And so we have researchers that are really, really looking at the intersection of, of using that data to then tailor interventions to, to better meet needs and also to make sure that individuals are empowered in terms of what their rights are in those situations. So those are just a few of the key findings that, that I certainly can point to um, off the top of my head here. Um, but again, Narek Dot com and also please feel free to reach out to me and, and I'd be happy to share further information. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Forber Pratt. Uh, next question for Dr. Ling. Could you say more about the frameworks or evidence of standards of evidence that are used to determine which practices or interventions um, actually uh, get implemented? And um, and if there's time, this might be a even bigger question to ask, you know, how reimbursement rates are determined. Sure, and and thank you for the question. Um, you know, the the short answer uh, is it depends on what it is, what is the the topic, the intervention, and what the benefit category is, um, as far as the process for evidence consideration. Um, a, as an example, um, I think you know the process um, may differ depending if it's a quality measurement uh, topic or a coverage topic, by and large, the vehicles to consider the totality of the evidence is, is really, uh, CMS may undertake the technical review, uh, CMS staff may do that. Um, that technical review might be uh, conducted by one of our federal partners, such as Agency for Healthcare Research, uh, for a variety of, of, of uh, policy and program purposes. Um, but there's also uh, technical expert panels that convene to opine on the sufficiency of evidence and the application of that evidence uh, to specific programs and policies. Um, the other unifying factor really here is that these opportunities are often announced by way of uh, the Federal Register and, you know, Federal Register may not be a, a common uh, information source uh, similar to New England Journal or any other uh, journal uh, publications that that uh, this community may be accustomed to, to referring to. But I think it's an important one uh, because it's also the, a common source of information for rulemaking, which is critically important, a vehicle that public comment is invited uh, for consideration for, for policy um, actions uh, by CMS. Um, and uh, the importance of public comment cannot be overemphasized, whereby uh, concepts, ideas, um, 
policies and programs might be proposed. And then the final really is a reflection of not only what was proposed, but adjusted and refined based on public comment. And each one of us as, as US citizens have the opportunity to, to help shape the final policy. Um, the final point I want to mention though is, you know, as you are, are um, conducting research, building the evidence, uh, keep in mind that the evidence that CMS seeks must be applicable to the population of beneficiaries served. And it is often a, a um, an afterthought uh, where, you know, the intent is to apply a treatment or service to a Medicare beneficiary population, and yet um, those who comprise the beneficiary population um, are not well represented in the research itself. So I think there's opportunity, uh, to, you know, to be be clear about that request in 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 what we're looking for in the evidence that comes to us, along with as much detail as you can bring to bear, not only for whom the treatment or service is applied, but um, by whom, for how long, how much, um, and all, all are important details when it comes to considering uh, translating evidence into policies and, and programs. So thank you for the question, over. Great, thank you. Um, so if, uh, two more questions I'd like to ask. One is uh, Dr. Lang, if you can stay on, and then the other is to Dr. Everett. So uh, first, Dr. Lang, uh, if you, could you comment on uh, Effort stance on CMS's plan to reimburse for digital behavioral health services, for example, self-guided or coached apps. So, um, a terrific question. Um, so, uh, we are learning um, about what is um, in the category of digital care and services. Um, the, the term is utilized to apply to everything from um, monitoring, remote monitoring, um, software that is, uh, you know, in, included and helps um, uh, refine the accuracy of uh, covered uh, services and, and treatments to uh, items and services that are completely independent, completely virtual or digital. So what we're hoping for is to get some clarity when, when uh, the field is thinking about digital, what is actually meant. Definitional clarity would be uh, really quite welcome. Um, and the application of the the intervention, if you will, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, to to whom, for what, by whom, um, and all of the details that might be important for CMS um, in considering, you know, where where would the treatment and service fit in terms of a benefit category. Um, inclusion in a already existing uh, treatment or service or intervention. Um, so, you know, those those type of details would be most welcome, uh, but really summing up a request for definitional clarity um, for all of the above as it applies to the beneficiary population that CMS serves. Thank you for the question, over. Great, thanks, Dr. Lang. Uh, and one final question to Dr. Everett. Um, could you talk more about the early success of 988? And this references your slide number 46. All's being answered. And um, by and large, so far, I mean, it's only been two weeks that it's been, you know, available at this scale. Um, but we've seen an uptick in the number of calls that were answered and also an improvements in the response rates of the calls. And so it's, it's so far so good. Um, we know it's not a perfect system, but, uh, you know, it took one of our ways that we think about it is it took 60 years for 911 to become the system that it is today. And we're knowing we do know that it's going to take some time for the system to mature, but we're 
uh, really, you know, we really feel like it represents an important gateway and also has a number of important questions, um, you know, with regards to who's best served. One of the things that's very important to us uh, with regards to access to mental health services through 988 is to set it up so that it has uh, an equity lens to it. We know many communities won't call 911 because they don't trust what the answers are going to be, if, particularly since the answers could include dispatching law enforcement. And we want 988 to not have that effect. And that is really uh, is a, a big opportunity for research to look at how can we effectively give us information on how we can effectively uh, manage 988 so that it's trusted uh, among communities uh, you know, that have typically don't trust 911 calls. Dr. Herbert, thank you. Um, so our session is uh, to give a, a really big round of applause and everybody a virtual round of applause to our presenters, uh, Dr. Valdez, Dr. Forper Pratt, Dr. Ling, Dr. Scott, and Dr. Everett. So thank you so much uh, for coming today. Really uh, I appreciate hearing, hearing your talks and hearing your priorities and hearing how um, we can work with you better. Uh, so I'd now like to turn uh, the platform over to Dr. Denny Pintello for a wrap up. Hello, everybody, and thank you again. What an amazing conference. We have heard from so many people, and especially there were so many fantastic presentations over the last few days. Uh, I would like to end our day by thanking these outstanding speakers and panelists for their amazing presentations. We're so grateful that you were willing to share your research findings to over 1,800 registrants from 90 countries it's grown since we started yesterday from 1700 to 1800, uh, which is the largest audience that we have ever hosted. So over the past two days, we have heard so many positive messages and feedback from our attendees. And I personally have been very touched by some of the messages that you have found this conference so meaningful and important to your work. So as I shared with you at the beginning of our conference, we hope that the speakers and the sessions that you attended have inspired and re-energized you. And we encourage you to please bring the research findings, implementation strategies, and lessons learned back to your universities, clinics, and communities so we can continue to not only advance the science, but make a positive difference in the lives of those who need effective mental health services. So lastly, please take great care, and we look forward to seeing you at our next MHSR conference in 2024. Thank you.